one thing I want to start with was uh, uh, the documentary we watched at the end of class last Thursday. I, I'm assuming that a lot of you had a chance maybe to discuss it at least a little bit in section. I know in my section we did. But I thought it might be worth uh, uh, people sharing a few comments uh, about the documentary. As you recall, the context I wanted you to watch that in was uh, the role media played in the Selma, Alabama campaign and what you found was uh, significant about that role and the impact it had as events unfolded. Uh, who, who would like to share some of their thoughts on that? Who wants to go first? Come on, you can do this. Yes? Why is that? Who would, who would like to share why that is, that seeing the marchers in sort of real time on television versus reading about it in the newspaper or hearing about it on radio, why that was so significant? Uh, again, the civil rights movement had been going on for a long time at this point and had been getting a lot of coverage, but in terms of television news, this was a relatively new development. Why was it more impactful than say uh, an article in New York Times telling you exactly what happened. Maybe it's easier to sympathize with someone if you actually see them being hit. Mm -hmm. Reading, they were hit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the governor of Alabama, George Wallace? He was talking about uh, his initial thoughts on how they were going to manage this after the uh, marchers were attacked. And does anybody remember what the original plan was before he saw the news footage? Anybody remember that? They mentioned that in the documentary, what his original plan was, yeah. It was they were going to form a line at the end of the bridge, and if they didn't stop, they were going to move aside. Yeah, that's what they were going to do. But after it all fell apart, though, how were they going to manage the, da or the damage control from the fallout? Yeah. They were going to say that the African Americans attacked them. Mm -hmm. Like they instigated the incident. Yeah, yeah. And what do the, the moving pictures dramatically show? That yeah, was not the case. And uh, we talked a little bit in my section about this is something that has played out a lot in recent times. For instance, the uh, Oscar Grant shooting at the BART station. And uh, of course, they made a film. Some of you may have seen the film. I'm sure some of you remember it from the news stories. And it's possible that uh, that might have ended up differently in terms of the officer who did it because uh, he was trying to uh, sell a different story at first, but what happened? Why did the, why did the story have to change? They, yeah, and it wasn't just some footage. It, it was like uh, everybody, everybody is a, a cameraman now, right? You've all got your cell phones. And so there were angles, multiple angles of the shooting that you could see from every which way. And it was hard to say, oh, well, yeah, I was feeling threatened because Clearly, that wasn't the case. None of the video the, from the many cell phones that uh, shot that, that day bore that out. So um, technology definitely, new technology, can impact the course of history. Uh, I would argue that uh, the Selma campaign would have not have been as successful as it was. We might not have gotten uh, the Voting Rights Act through Congress at that time had there not been television coverage. And, and that, that's pretty uh, significant when you think about it. So media technology isn't just there to serve us and to entertain us and maybe make our information gathering easier, but it can actually impact uh, the course of history. Now today and a little bit next week, we're going to talk about how we got here. You know, I find it really interesting, for instance, that I, I'm still amazed at all the media tools I have at my disposal because I was born in a world much different than the one you were born into. Everything you have now, a lot of it existed when you were born, and it's this second nature to you. I was born before that Selma, Alabama march 
where television news was a brand new thing, where uh, you had three or four channels, where you did not have uh, information in the palm of your hand. A totally different world. So, so I still marvel at it, but I realize that your generation, having grown up in the internet age, from birth to now, it, you know, it's, it's second nature to you. So I think it's kind of important to go back and get a little uh, uh, historical context in terms of how we got here from, from early mankind. How did we get to this point where we're so media saturated, uh, dating all the way back to when people couldn't even talk? What, what were some key events that happened along the way? So this is going to be kind of a quick uh, run through several thousand years of history. Uh, probably won't be the most scintillating uh, lecture I give this semester, but uh, hopefully it provides a little bit of context of some of what some of the big moments are and why, why they're important. Uh, first of all, going back to the beginning of humankind and, and what it meant and, and how communication worked then. Let's, let's go back to the time and researchers study this all the time, but obviously, to a large degree, all you can do is form conjectures and theories because there's no records of those times. You, you just have to guess what it was like. But there was a time when verbal communication did not exist, okay? Um, yet there is a need, I, I would argue, in, in all species, there's a need to communicate. So uh, does, uh, does anybody remember how, how, from the readings, early communication? What, what, how did that happen if people don't have language yet? What would they do? Yeah. Yeah. And this gets into a concept that was brought up in the first article, uh, which is uh, called nonverbal codes. These are ways of communicating that do not involve language. Uh, they listed four of them in that article. The first one was called uh, performance codes, okay? Uh, this is nonverbal signs expressed through uh, body action, facial expressions, eye movement, uh, touch. Uh, it can be, you know, it could be a grunt or, you know, some, sound, some kind of basic sound as well. But essentially, it, it's nonverbal, okay? Now think about uh, how many of you uh, have uh, like younger siblings that you remember as babies, or maybe some of you even have nephews and nieces at this point uh, that you've, you've been around babies. Can babies communicate? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you pretty much know when they're happy and we know when they're sad or know when they want something. You may not know exactly what they want at any given moment, but you know something's up because they communicate with you through facial expressions, through basic sounds. So even as a newborn, as humans, we understand the need to communicate, to, to have uh, our, our needs met, okay? So a uh, performance codes, that, that fits into that. The next one on the list uh, was artifactual codes. Now, uh, break that word down, uh, artifact. What, what is an artifactual code? Um, do you uh, imagine means, or if you remember from the reading, what, what's an artifactual code? Yeah. It's like clothing, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, basically, artifactual codes can be clothing, it can be cosmetics, it can be status symbols, art objects, even the way you decorate your room. And think about this in terms of, uh, uh, since you've all, uh, I think most of you anyway, are, are living in dorms here on campus, think about uh, as you, walked into your, your dorm building for the first time and as you've kind of moved your way around and you've been in different people's rooms, were you able to learn anything about those people before you ever had a conversation with them? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You, you, um, the thing I used to do, and again, this dates me how old I am, but when I was in college, if I was at somebody's uh, apartment or, or dorm, I might look at their record collection, vinyl. They might look at that and see, okay, what do they listen to, okay? If, if they listen to a, a bunch of easy listening versus metal or whatever, you, it, it tells you something about the person and their personality. Likewise, the way they decorate the room, how orderly it is, how cluttered it is. You, you learn things uh, from artifactual codes in the same way about how we dress, obviously. Um, 
Media codes, this is something that is used a lot uh, today and has been used for many, many decades. Uh, media codes are ways of um, sending a message without specific words, but how you present them or how you, or how you present a, a particular image. For instance, um, has it, have any of you ever seen historical uh, headlines, say like when Pearl Harbor was uh, attacked in 19... Uh, uh, 41. Uh, did anybody ever see historical papers like that? What can you tell me about how the page looks when you look at the page? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the headlines, yeah, huge headline. What does that tell you before you even read it? Yeah. Not a big deal. This is a big deal. This is really important. Uh, and it sends a message. I, I, uh, many years ago, when I first worked on this campus, I was an advisor to the campus newspaper, and I remember one of my entertainment editors wrote a story and used, used one of those giant headlines on some dance recital story or something. And I had to explain to him, you're sending the wrong message here. This is a dance recital. This, this is not World War III beginning, so you're, you're sending the wrong kind of message with how you structure the headlines. So it's very important to consider. Also in other forms of media, uh, soundtracks for movies, okay? Uh, you have the scene playing out in the movie, but quite often there'll be a score underneath that scene. What does that often tell you? What kind of things can that score underneath the scene tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Because you can have a scene mm -hmm. uh, and change the music. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've actually photographed this a little bit. You change the music in the scene, and it'll completely change how you view the content that's being shown. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was around somebody other. That's, yeah, did you have you had your hand up? I was just going to say that also, um, in like shows and stuff, tends to be like parallel with the mood that's being portrayed like, in a particular scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a visual cue as well. Yeah, uh, and and in, in terms of you think, it's like there are some scenes if you if you play them out, and it's really interesting by the way. If you've ever had a chance to see like in uh, DVD extras where they show cut scenes that aren't scored because they were cut before the uh, the, the score was put in, and you you don't get the same sense of drama if it's supposed to be dramatic or if it's supposed to be sad or if it's supposed to be menacing. So so that score is underneath there to send again a media code that this is a scary moment coming up or this is really something bad's about to happen and it and it telegraphs that a little bit and gets you uh, sometimes amped up for yeah, I always think of the Jaws thing, you know, how when somebody's swimming and you hear the dun 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 you know, okay, somebody's about to get eaten. All right, you know you and sometimes they use it to fake you out too, right? Yeah, in a couple scenes, uh, they play that score and you think something's gonna happen and then it turns out it's a false alarm, but they're trying to amp you up uh, as an audience member. Uh, the last of the nonverbal codes that was listed in the article was uh, contextual codes. These codes signify how we use space to provide context to a situation or a relationship. Um, for example, you're all familiar with the concept of personal space, right? Um, if, if you're standing someplace and you have, let's say your girlfriend or your boyfriend comes over and they walk right up to you like this, is that gonna bother you? Probably not. I mean, you're, you're, you, you have this extra intimate relationship with this person, so they're allowed into that space as opposed to say, uh, somebody in this class who you haven't had a chance to meet yet, they're from one of the other sections, if they walk up to you after class and go, hey, how's it going, right into your face, it's going to creep you out a little bit, right? Because you use space to kind of, uh, you know, define your relationships with, with others. And, and uh, um, also in terms of contextual, uh, the way you, uh, your work desk is arranged, can communicate, uh, you know, for instance, what you do for a living or how organized you might be. Uh, so my work desk would send out a very bad message about my organizational skills to everybody because it looks like uh, somebody tossed a bomb on there on most days, all right? So when we talk about these codes that were brought up in the article, which, which of these codes would have been used by ancient civilizations, but talking about the period of time where people 
had either no language skills or very r rudimentary language skills? What would, which ones would they have used? Uh, performance codes. Yeah, definitely with performance. That's the facial expressions, the basic sounds. Uh, what else would they have used? Yeah. Artifactual. Artifactual, yeah. What you wear. Uh, for instance, if you're in a part of a tribe, uh, you, certain articles of clothing could signify you're the leader of that group of people. Um, what else? Would contextual work? Yeah. Uh, you know, like you were saying about like the World War II. Yeah. Like throwing out ads out there. And, uh, for example, like the politics one, like, I think it was, uh, was it Uncle Sam? Mm -hmm. And they would like throw out ads like that. Yeah. But but would that would that work for like ancient people? Would oh, ancient. yeah, like early early humankind would that work? No, no. So, but what about contextual? I saw a few. You nod your head yes on contextual. Why would contextual work as a nonverbal communication? What do you think? Yeah. I guess you can like show respect by giving someone space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe you bow, maybe, you know, you do different things. Yeah, pr provide a certain amount of space. Yeah, what else? What about media in the sense of uh, storytelling with kids? Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. Um, that's, now, that's a little further in the timeline. We're going to get to that in a second. But uh, uh, so at the point where uh, cave paintings come into existence, absolutely. I would, I would completely agree with that. At, at the very beginning of uh, communication, that when people didn't have language at that might not have been a thing yet, uh, possibly, you know, again, we can't say with 100% certainty, but media would be the last one on that list to be used by uh, very ancient civilizations. Um, so why did humans go the way, uh, they, they, these, these are all things that can communicate a lot. We, and as you all know, you can communicate a lot with nonverbal communication in terms of uh, facial expressions and, um, you, you can get a vibe off of people, whether they like you, don't like you, they're excited, they're bored, any number of things you get without even talking. Uh, why did humans need to go the way of developing spoken language? Why do you suppose that was important? Yeah. Um, it says it was easier to translate and easier to master. Also that when they were making tools, if you had to use hand signals, you have to stop what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, speak to them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that second one, that was brought up in some of the writings of Darwin in terms of his theories of evolution that uh, he felt there was a very practical reason for developing language because in terms of trying to communicate through, through nonverbal ways, you sometimes had to use hand gestures. Well, this freed up your hands. So say, for instance, you, you're, you're on a hunting expedition and, and uh, you, you've, you've got this extra way of communicating so you can hold your weapons and be ready to do what you need to do. So that was certainly part of it. Also, the, the whole concept of um, forming more complex ideas, right? As, as people's brains begin to develop and they start having more complex thoughts or start to develop in that direction, uh, nonverbal is not going to cover those kind of complex uh, thoughts in terms of uh, say, for instance, you start figuring out that if you go to a certain place in certain kinds of weather, you will have a successful hunt. Okay, you need to be able to communicate that and, and with others so that you can uh, uh, get the most out of uh, your hunt and, and, and it's increase your survival mode. Because that's the other thing we have to remember, too, about uh, early humans. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, there's been speculation that the lifespan of uh, many humans in that era was probably mid 20s. If you know, if you had a good day, so to speak, uh, mid 20s. Think about that. Your your lives would be almost two thirds over now, um, and uh, it's kind of weird to think about. I would have been dust years ago. So you know, it's it. This is it was really a survival mode for people, and and uh, verbal communication played a big part of this. Um, also, as society starts to develop, what happens is you go from situations where early humans probably were clustered into smaller groups, 
but then the groups start becoming larger and larger and, and more complicated as societies develop. Um, so as that happens, as groups start to expand, as civilizations, uh, as little tribes become villages and so on and so forth, uh, why, why is it uh, important uh, to be able to continue to develop language? And then ultimately, why would it be important then to um, develop writing as the next step? Which, which gets into the second article. Well, why is it important to develop in that direction? Um, writing can be for future Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And why, why is it important to start recording things? If we're talking about developing now, we've got, we've got a verbal language, but we're becoming a larger, more complex society. Why is it, what kind of things would it be important to write down and have records of? What can you think of? Yeah. Maps. Maps. You mean like where, where we are in relation to other things? That would be very important. What else? Family records. Family records. Yeah, as you become larger, right, uh, you, you don't know who's related to who necessarily unless there are some kind of records of that. So to keep uh, from inter-family marriages, for instance, happening, it would be kind of nice to know who everybody is and who they're related to. Uh, what else? <laughs> calendars. Why would calendars be important? Yeah, and, and but but specifically, what would be the practical purpose? Do you think for you know ancient civilizations to develop writing for calendars? Mm -hmm. Seasons. Yeah, seasons are very important, especially because you're growing food. Uh, as societies become more developed, they start moving from a, a hunting based. Uh, method of eating to uh, growing crops and knowing when to grow them, knowing where to grow them, and, uh, and what kind of conditions are uh, most uh, applicable to a successful crop is, is really important. Okay. Um, also, when you start developing, start becoming larger as a society, you also begin to get to a point where people start owning things, right? pieces of land. It's, it's, it's not like we're all living in the same cave anymore. Now uh, I've, I've built a little home here and I've got a piece of property. Well, is that my piece of property? Well, yes it is because we have records saying that I own that property. So those kind of things. The history of your people. Uh, the history suddenly starts becoming important and for multiple reasons because we can learn what didn't work for previous generations and what did work and move forward. Um, but a lot of history, even before writing, there, there were attempts at maintaining history in the oral tradition. Uh, in other words, uh, families, for instance, if you want to maintain a family history, somebody would often be tasked and this happened a lot with uh, tribes uh, in Africa. Somebody in that would be tasked with learning the entire history of your branch of the family. And unlike a book where you can flip to the page you want, they, these people would have to start at the beginning and run through the whole thing if you wanted to learn what your family's history was all about. Slight problem though, what if the person tasked with ma maintaining all that information dies in a, an accident uh, or gets sick? Uh, before they can pass it on to somebody else. So the, here's a way to have a permanent record of what came before and uh, the, the lessons that could be learned there. Okay. Um, now you mentioned the cave paintings. Um, what do you suppose, that, that would probably be the earliest form of what we call <coughs> written uh, a communication, also you know, visual communication. Um, People often speculated on why those cave paintings were created. And again, it's all speculation. Why, why do you think early humans first uh, did those paintings? Yeah. Uh, I think it was to record like, different traditions and like, what they were doing uh, during that time. That yeah, that's, that's a pretty good theory, the fact that uh, what you see depicted quite often are things like hunts. And, and, and you get a sense of what kind of things these people did based on, on the paintings. Um, it's also interesting too because at this point in terms of the development of a written language, 
it, it, it shows an important component that had been missing previously in humans, which was imagination. And think about what I mean by that, imagination. Um, you have to take what you see out here and then try to depict it on a wall, okay? Um, it may not look exactly like what you're seeing. Uh, you know, obviously you've seen the pictures of the cave paintings. But you're, but you're using your imagination to transfer what you're seeing with your eyes in, a, in another way and depict it in a different way. The same imagination is important for developing that written language. How can we create a series of symbols or codes that can communicate things to people uh, with, without speaking? Uh, and in fact, all the earliest um, uh, alphabets uh, tended to be picture-based. For instance, uh, uh, one of the most famous, which was mentioned in the reading, hieroglyphics. What do you know about hieroglyphics? Where'd those come from it? And uh, what kind of things they, they look like? Anybody familiar with hieroglyphics? Yeah. Is it primarily uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian mm -hmm. form of writing? What's that? What's that? Mesopotamian yeah. and Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah, and if you, have you seen them at least, you probably have seen them at least in movies where they depict, you know, uh, maybe the mummy even, you know, someplace where they're in, a, in a, an Egyptian tomb and you see, you see hieroglyphics on the wall. And, and they're picture-based, right? You see, you see people, you figures, and, uh, and symbols, a combination of pictures and symbols that communicates uh, a certain thing. Uh, the Chinese also developed uh, a very early form of this as well. Uh, and again, very picture-based. In, in fact, uh, Chinese writing of today is essentially descended from this picture-based uh, uh, form of communication that was developed thousands of years ago. Now why, even though it was effective to a degree, why would the picture-based writing, such as hieroglyphics, ultimately be a bit of a problem in terms of trying to communicate? Why would it not necessarily be that efficient? What would you imagine would be some of the downfalls or struggles with that? Yeah. Um, someone can interpret it different than it actually was supposed to. Mm -hmm. the get yeah, yeah. If it depending on who's creating it, it could it could uh, certainly uh, create a wrong impression. Oh, I thought that was a cow. I didn't realize that was a dog or a cat. You know, whatever. Yeah, it, those kind of things could certainly happen. What else? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. More, you have more freedom when you have symbols rather mm -hmm. than a picture that means a specific phrase. Yeah. Yeah, think about that. Think about how difficult it would be to create a narrative using picture based communication. It would, t would take a very long time. It would not be. Uh, you know, this, if, you're, if you're drawing a cat, it's not necessarily adaptable in multiple different ways. There, there are so many different things about it that just do not um, work efficiently. And that's where uh, then other civilizations, uh, like the Phoenicians and the Hebrews, started developing uh, more condensed, uh, just symbol-based instead of picture-based uh, alphabets. Uh, the ancient Greeks came along, added vowels to the process, and then uh, having that in the mix, it be, kind of became the template for m most of our modern uh, alphabets of today. How many letters are in our alphabet? What's that? 26. Yeah, 26, yeah, is that what you said? Yeah, so, is it, um, so think about that. Think about how many symbols you have. Um, less than 30, okay, less than 30 symbols and now think about all the books, all the stories, and uh, you know, all the information that is out there, all the information that you can find over in Schultz and beyond, that is all based on under 30 symbols. That's what I call versatility. That's what I call efficient. That is an efficient way to write because you take a, a small based, uh, situation in terms of number of symbols, but it can be used in so many varieties of ways depending on how you arrange them that it's almost infinite, the number of, of words and uh, uh, paragraphs and stories and anything you want to do, anything you want to tell, it's, it's, it's almost infinite. So this is, this is a very uh, a critical thing. All right, so 
writing also becomes important for another key reason. And this is a reason uh, called self-sufficiency. Why, why is writing important in the context of that? It might be the most important thing about, about the written word. How does that, how does that create self-sufficiency? What do you think? And a, and, and a growing sense of independence. Can you imagine why? If you don't have written words, if you don't have written language, how do you learn anything? How do you learn? Yeah. That's exactly right. If you do not uh, have a written language, somebody if you want to learn something, you have to find somebody who knows that, and then they have to tell you about it. You have to depend on others. If people start keeping records, say, for instance, we talked about how important crops were to early civilizations, and there are records available someplace in terms of when is the best place to, uh, when is the best time to grow something, where is the best place to grow something, you can seek that out yourself and, and learn from that and become self-sufficient. Um, think about how that's even increased now. You know, I like to bring uh, modern parallels into it. Uh, think about how the internet age has made you more self-sufficient. Can anybody give me examples of how you're more self-sufficient uh, because of the internet? Any th things you do in your life, things you're able to do or have the option of doing, yeah. Yeah, you don't even have to leave where you're sitting, right? You know, you can do it right now, right here. You don't have to go even walk over to a library anymore, right? Uh, you had your hand up. Same thing. Yeah, um, and it and it also adds a visual component to it as well, which I think is kind of cool. I've I've taken on over the years uh, several projects. You know, like uh, once I decided I wanted to learn how to rebuild, refurbish an electric guitar, and I'd never done that before. But I was able to find uh, dozens of videos on the internet with people walking you through it. And I searched through those, found the ones that the people actually seemed like they knew what they were doing and, were, and came out with a good product at the end. And basically emulated that approach. And it came out great. And I'm convinced that if I had not had the internet, if I just had somebody write me out instructions, it would have been a disaster but I was able to visual, add the visual component to the information that I could access now. And, and so that's kind of a cool thing, and we can learn to do things on our own without anybody's help just because of this media tool. So this, this is what the original really important thing of, of writing as a media tool was, the ability for people to, to seek out uh, information and to somehow be able to um, use it to better themselves or better their situation. But what's missing from the equation? Now that we have written language, what's missing? I mean, okay, we've got written languages, so that means, end of story, we're all self-sufficient and everything's great, right? You have to be able to communicate that you, What's that? Yeah, yeah, and, and this is kind of, you're kind of, I think you're touching upon literacy, you know, issues. Does, who, who, had, who had access to uh, written records, typically? Yeah. Generally, whoever was in charge at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, the power structure. Remember we talked about, you know, in terms of how the, the Internet is such a democratic tool because anybody can access it and get to it. Early writing's not like that. Uh, it's, it's, it tends to be the power structure, the more um, well-to-do segments of the society have access to this. Also, they're the same segments of society that actually learn how to use it, how to read. So Ill illiteracy was still pretty uh, predominant, even in the age of written languages, because the average person did not have uh, the ability to access that easily. Um, and this, uh, this changed with uh, the printing press. 
Okay, we're going to talk about the printing press uh, in just a second. What I'd like you to do right now, though, um, is answer these three questions that I wrote on the board, and then we're going to do our usual drill of having you get in uh, to small groups for a few minutes and discuss your answers, and then we'll discuss them um, among the class. Okay, so first question, Mark Twain called the printing press the greatest invention uh, in the history of the world, I believe were his words. The greatest invention in the history of the world. It's a pretty bold claim. Was he right? And then why or why not? Okay. Second question. Can you see any parallels between the emergence of the printing press and the internet? Think about that. Are there any, any things that we can say are similar about these, these two milestone events? And then finally, which do you think will be seen as more impactful down the road? When, when historians 100 years from now look back on this birth of the internet era that we're all living in, will they say the printing press was still the big bang or no, the internet was the bigger bang? in terms of impact on society? Which do you think will be seen as having the biggest impact on society? So take a few minutes, kind of jot down your thoughts on that, and then we'll, we'll break into uh, smaller groups. OK, so first question, Mark Twain, calling the printing press the greatest invention in the history of the world. Uh, he would have every reason to love it, since he made a lot of money out of the existence of the printing press with all his books. Uh, but was he right? Would you consider it the greatest invention in the history of the world? What were some of your answers? Yeah. I think it was. Okay. Why is that? Because I think it didn't just bring easier access to knowledge, but motivation to make knowledge easier accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think that the internet is born based off that. Let's make knowledge even easier. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Uh, what he's saying is uh, not just does it make the printing press make for the first time information available to the masses and uh, creates the term mass media, but also creates the motivation for more media and faster and easier media. It starts that journey. Okay. What else? Yeah. Um, I think it's a debatable. Definitely, it's debatable. Mm -hmm. Any other answers on that? Those are all really good answers, by the way. Yeah. I definitely think under the context of mass media, it's the greatest invention. But I think if you branch out and start looking at like the wheel, probably the greatest invention just for mankind moving around. You go to vaccines, the greatest invention of medicine. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things about there, but there's definitely yeah. a form of mass media. It led to everything else that we have. Yeah. Well, and that's why I love absolute statements like that, because they are so debatable, and it's a great, great discussion to have. And, and, and we are kind of going uh, that way with question three when we get to it, too. So um, number two, any parallels between the emergence of the printing press and the internet? Can you see, even though they're separated by hundreds of years, can you see some similarities in, in terms of their impact, in terms of how they affected society? Who, who wants to tackle that one first? Or is it just two, two phenomenons that really don't bear any relationship to each other? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, we'll both uh, spread information quicker. Mm -hmm. And also, both can, like, can be used to keep records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? What do you think? Yeah. I think the internet has a lot more abilities and get more out of it, but without the printing 
press, who knows where we'd be today, like where would the internet be? Yeah. It's like the printing press that led up to mm-hmm. today. Yeah. What about society as a whole? Are there any parallels to be drawn in terms of societal impact uh, on, in terms of the printing press and the internet? What do you think? Yeah. The ability for people to become educated. Mm-hmm. Uh, because before the printing press, books had to be handwritten. Yeah. So you only had as many, uh, you only had as many uh, sources mm-hmm. from as there were people to write the books. Right, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I saw a qu- uh, commercial on television the other night that uh, told me how important the Internet's become. It was talking about a program to make sure all grade school kids uh, have Internet access of some uh, kind. And then the commercial, it shows a teacher asking questions, and you see the sad-looking kids sitting there kind of hunched down, not wanting to raise their hand because they don't have internet access and all their friends and classmates have it. And I thought that's interesting that it, it's become such a vital part of how we learn about things now, even though uh, it's still, in terms of being used on a large basis, it's still you know, a little more than 20 years old in terms of the general public. So I, I just find that really fascinating that it's become so ingrained. Yeah, Did you have, oh, just stretching, okay. Anybody else have any comments? Another thing I might add to this, and this is why, again, there have been many impactful moments in media development, but I do, I do consider the printing press and the internet to be the two big bangs in the sense that it didn't just change communication, but when you think about it, it disrupted everything, everything. Think about how you shop now and how you buy things and uh, think about what people did, how that compares to what people did before the internet. I mean, Amazon's making tons of money for a reason. I, you know, people shop online now a, a lot. That has implications not only to um, uh, uh, brick wall, brick and mortar store owners, but it, it has implications in, in terms of just the entire business model of, of our nation now in terms of how things are sold, how goods are distributed, how they're advertised. Um, so many implications, and I would challenge you to kind of find a walk of life or a, a business, a, any section of society that is not impacted by the existence of the internet, and in much the same way with the printing press. So that being said, that brings us to the final question, which will be looked at by future historians as the most impactful in terms of the huge change it put upon society? Will it be the printing press or the internet? Yeah. Personally, I think it's the printing press because when it came out, there was nothing like it. It was everything was handwritten. Mm-hmm. Everything. I mean, you can't read someone's handwriting or screwed. Yeah. So the internet was something that was led up to. Okay. That was. I mean, it was still written then that people are so mystified with today. But I feel like with new technologies, we're not as um, surprised with what's coming out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, iPhone seven. Um, with the printing press, this was something that created mass communication. It's something that created um, the circulation that we have today. Okay. What, what were you going to say? Um, to counter that point, I guess. <laughs> um, uh-huh. I was just going to say that I think it comes down to the rapidity in which information is put out uh, when you compare the two. And I think um, now with the birth of the internet and how prevalent it is in societies across the world, you can have information put out um, so like instantly on the internet and have it so widespread, whereas the printing press did that, but mm-hmm. when you compare the rates in which they do that, I just think that the internet is much more efficient in that way. Mm-hmm. Others, what do you think? Uh, I think is the internet is more impactful because it did everyone a voice, mm-hmm. and everyone is part of the media, so you know, part of the media is part of the media. So he's, he's voting internet and saying that the fact that it, it is potentially the most democratic uh, uh, media that we've ever had, that, that makes it more impactful. Okay, now I see some more hands, go ahead. Me? Yeah. Um, well, to counter that, yeah. um, the penny press was the first democratic, or no, 
much for Democratic, but it's what created democratization. I mean, um, I don't know what they were called, but when, or the Liberty Beavers, yeah. I think, with Benjamin Franklin and, um, I forgot who wrote it, but you know the Founding Fathers, yeah. they created the um, anonymous uh, mm -hmm. newspaper section that I think was Publius was okay. the thing. It's, it, the pen papers gave everyone a voice. Yeah. The internet kind of copied that. Yeah. Okay, what were you going to say? A lot of the was like suppl it supplemented daily life, whereas today the internet has like become us, and it's really mm -hmm. integrated into, it is our life really. So I think that's, that's why the internet is a bigger impact on us. That, that's an interesting yeah. argument if you didn't hear that, the, that, that uh, whereas the, she's saying the printing press uh, certainly uh, changed and enriched our lives by giving us more information. She's basically saying the internet has become our lives. And that's, that's a really interesting point, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, I call this my uh, who's more important, the rock and roll Elvis or the Beatles argument, you know, because you might say, one person might say the Beatles, the other person say, well, if it wasn't Elvis, you wouldn't have had the Beatles. So, you know, you, you, you go round and round in circles. And that's why I love these discussions, because there's really not a right or wrong answer, just a, um, but a lot of really good comments I'm getting so far. Yeah, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that people also can make careers for themselves off the internet. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that and that's interesting too, by the way. Yeah, my wife does that currently. She has her own business and after having to drive to work every day, she's working at home and uh, saving a lot of money on gasoline. Yeah, so that's that's a, a definitely a, a big change. Yeah. I think that's a printing press because it's open door to such huge amount of literacy and the growth of that. Mm -hmm. necessarily require literacy. Obviously, to seek out certain things, it does, but there's lots of other things it doesn't. Yeah? Um, I think when the free press came out, everybody thought that was it. They were like, this is, this is how we're communicating for the rest of our lives mm -hmm. up until the internet. Yeah. Now we think, oh, well, none of us can think. Well, now that we have the internet and the media of another way of communication, mm -hmm. but maybe there will be one in a thousand years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're talking about how not even be able to conceive what's coming next, and people didn't see, see what was going to come next in terms of communication breakthroughs. I was thinking about uh, the fact that uh, I, I saw online today uh, Star Trek turned 50 years old today when the series pr uh, premiered. And maybe you've ever watched the series or the reboot movies or any of it. Um, if you watch the original series like I, I did when I was a kid, yes, I am that old, that when I watched the original series, um, they, even though it was set in the future, the, the future world they imagined was still limited by what they knew in the present. For instance, they, they had the ship computer, which took up an entire wall. You know, they'd go in to try to find data on the ship's computer, took up an entire wall, and it had reel-to-reel -reel tapes on it. You know, think about that. Which, you know, um, who does that anymore, right? You know, but they had no idea about digital or downloading or any of these things at that point. I think the first experiments with the internet were still a couple years away. So they, 
you know, they couldn't even imagine, even though it was a very imaginative show, just how much things would change uh, in the world. Yeah. I think you have to look at it in a political sense, too, mm -hmm. because I definitely attribute the fall of divine monarchy mm -hmm. to the printing press. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people started realizing that their uh, kings or queens actually were not given divine power mm -hmm. uh, to rule, and that caused a lot of um, upsetting. Yeah. And so that's why we don't really see any monarchies, like legitimate monarchies. Uh, All powerful, uh, yeah. Um, but at the same time, you have the internet where, like you said, I think it was Egypt, they overthrew yeah. the government. Yeah, using using Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, essentially. So, yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to decide because they both do basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just whether the scale at the time was bigger. Mm -hmm. on each side. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about question one and uh, as well, and like the responses people gave for the greatest invention. Mm -hmm. There was the wheel to and vaccines. Yeah. yeah. And when you think about it in terms of the internet. Um, in the printing press as well, the information that it was able to put out. Mm -hmm. um, you can have access to wheels by Uber or Lyft, mm -hmm. and vaccines, yeah. you can look up information, obviously they could point you to a, a hospital mm -hmm. and access it. Um, and so those components that internet encompasses, I think that mm -hmm. it ties really any invention together where you yeah. now have access to it. Yeah. Well, these are, these are all really good comments. Okay, we'll take one more and then we'll move. But people do use it, though, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you, more often, I know when I'm in San Francisco, that's what I do, whip the phone out, say, I'm at this corner, come get me. You know, it's, how easy is that, you know? So, so it does change the way. Yeah, you're right, people can still do it the old, the old school way, but, but the, the fact that we have the ability to do that, I think, is, is kind of interesting. And again, lots of really interesting comments on this. I, I, I think this is a good place to jump uh, more deeply into uh, talking about the printing press. Kind of based off the one of the last comments we heard, talking about disrupting a society of that era. Okay, so first of all, did everybody learn about uh, uh, Gutenberg and the printing press when you were in school, right? Okay, and so a lot of times, the when you when you learn about these things, the um, they tend to put the date. Um, in, uh, in terms of uh, the printing press and the big explosion for the 1450s. Uh, that's, that's what I was sold when I was in school, but it, it, it's also very uh, uh, what I'd call Eurocentric in the sense that um, there were printing presses long before Gutenberg and his generation of printers came along. Uh, for, for instance, in China, um, many, many hundreds of years prior to that, they were developing printing presses, including some with movable type and, and these sort of things. But it, it never really uh, left China, even though, for instance, when European explorers like Marco Polo uh, visited China, uh, there are, are in his writings evidence that he witnessed, uh, uh, for instance, printed money, right? So obviously stuff was being printed, but he um, never really wrote about the technology that created that, and it never made it back to, uh, to Europe. Uh, Couple reasons for that. One, um, China, as as we know historically, has been kind of a closed society, and, and in that day and age, when people had to travel by foot or by horse, uh, new developments did not travel very fast. Uh, the second thing is when you get to um, uh, Europe of the 1450s, um, usually new developments in technology happen when not just because somebody has the idea, but but society has to be ready for the idea. And what do we know about Europe as, we, as we're heading out of the Middle Ages and it's like around the 1450s? What, what is, where is Europe poised at that point? Anybody remember that from history? What is it right on the cusp of? 
which by the way the printing press helped spread, yeah. The Renaissance, the Renaissance yeah. There, there's this awakening happening about you know, uh, different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Gutenberg, one thing he, you can say he contributed, and by the way, this is much like his press would have looked like. This is, you know, this is, this thing here is what spawned uh, a big sea change in society. Um, but what was key about his, his uh, printing press was it had reusable, movable type. And what that means is you could, uh, movable type already existed, but you could, he, had, he had a system where you could now take the same letters and reuse them. A lot of times in block printing, you could use them once or twice and then they're no good. You could clean them off, reuse them, arrange them in different ways. And of course, that's another reason this press took off more too, because uh, the uh, alphabet of Europe much less complex than the Chinese alphabet, so it's, it's a lot easier system uh, to use. So, so Gutenberg uh, came up uh, with this system that made it very easy to have printing presses. And I think somebody referenced it a few minutes ago, but what was the, um, what was the first um, printing job that Gutenberg did? I feel, feel like somebody mentioned that. What was his first printing job? Anybody remember? No one? Okay. The Bible. He, the first thing he printed was the Bible. Why might that be significant? It was hugely significant, by the way. Because not only did he print the Bible, but he printed it in his native tongue of German. Any, any theories of why that's, that's kind of a big deal? Yeah. Don't they say in the Bible? Well, here, here's, here's how things were set up in Europe at the time. You, you mentioned the monarchies, you know, these absolute monarchs throughout the country, but they all bowed down to a higher power. And who was that in Europe in the 1400s? The Pope, the Vatican, okay? And uh, at that era of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, all the Bibles were printed, printed in Latin a language that even then was essentially dead, that um, uh, nobody used. So, so who had the knowledge? Who had control over the knowledge of what's in the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, if you spoke Latin, if you were a, a, typically, if you spoke Latin, you were probably in, in the church hierarchy at some point. So what was going on was, I, if I'm a church leader, I'm telling you what the Bible has in it, and I'm telling you what it means. And I'm telling you that, based on what I'm seeing in there, that you need to do what I tell you, because I'm right, and you don't question that. Yeah? Yeah, people originally just prayed in churches, and it was against, um, like, the law, the church law to pray outside of the church. Yeah. Like, they didn't Yeah, with that, and yeah, what else? Go ahead. Like, like you said, the priests and the Pope and the Vatican like, yeah. dictated sort of the information that they were putting out there. Mm -hmm. They started doing like shady stuff, like they yeah. would say that if you pay a certain amount of money, you'd get into heaven and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. by him printing the Bible in German, people were able to see that that's not true. Yeah, that's right. Information is power. We've heard that expression before, right? And if you can't read the information, you don't have the power. Suddenly, you have uh, Bibles being printed in native tongues, and this, this immediately leads to people reading for themselves. It leads to a, a new generation of, of, of church leaders, such as uh, Martin Luther in Germany, who, who led the Reformation movement. And, um, and, and various branches of, of, that broke off from the Roman Catholic Church. I would, I would argue that a lot of this started with the ability to share the written word and, and to develop uh, and, and share ideas. It, you know, it also leads to an increase in literacy. And we all know that more literacy means more information uh, for the average person. So that was important as well. Um, Yet, it didn't instantly solve the problem of illiteracy. Probably when Gutenberg pr 
printed that first Bible, I, I think literacy was probably about, uh, I think, f uh, 5% uh, of the population could read, okay? But, interestingly enough, in less than 50 years after that Bible Gutenberg printed, uh, almost 40,000 editions of the Bible had been printed throughout Europe. 40,000 editions, not copies, editions, okay? So something big is going on. Uh, that something, you know, there's starting to be a shift in terms of, of the illiteracy question and a power shift in terms of, of uh, not only the church losing its grip on, on the continent as a whole, but also, um, as was mentioned, uh, monarchies being questioned. You, you see things happening uh, more and more where, where the absolute authority of anybody is beginning to be questioned. And this is important to remember too, because uh, when, when these things are questioned, what do, what do they use to get the message out? You can, you, you can speak in a town square and say, I think we should stand up against the king and his unjust laws. But now that you have a printing press, what can you do? What's that? Yeah. You can have people like in a lot of different areas say the same thing. Yeah. You can, and you can distribute your message on a wider scale. And if you look at uh, any of the history classes you've taken, you'll see that many, many revolutions over the years have been, have been uh, relied heavily upon written words, pamphlets. Our own American Revolution, uh, many, many pamphlets were written and distributed trying to drum up support, yeah. Do you think it's easier to kill someone who has an idea of something than to like, collect that version of yeah, and, and they tried to do that, you know, even, even though you're right, it was made it much harder to kill an idea when it was being printed and distributed, but they would still try. Uh, there were um, penalties for, for instance, for printers who put out material that was considered um, uh, against the state. Uh, sometimes they would impose heavy taxes on people who owned presses in order to inhibit them from using them to criticize governments or monarchies. So there, there was a pushback, but it became harder and harder. Again, we, we mentioned uh, Egypt uh, and the, that Twitter revolution a few minutes ago. It's really interesting to consider the fact that um, the Egyptian government tried to shut down all their various communication forms, which is why Twitter became so important to them, because all their traditional forms of communicating had been shut down by the government. You will see as we progress and our media tools uh, become uh, greater and greater that totalitarian governments are going to have a harder and harder time controlling media in their own countries. And you already see it happening. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see what that dynamic does in terms of world politics and the development uh, of society. So it, this starts with the printing press, the, the ability to mass distribute uh, things. You remember we talked about self-sufficiency. Now you, it's fully realized because you, you can not only print ideas or uh, put them in books, but now you can mass distribute them. And regardless of your background, it now becomes much easier, if you can learn to read, to seek out information on all kinds of subjects. Uh, and again, timing's important with the development of this because just as the printing press is exploding, here comes the Renaissance. And here comes not just paintings and things, but lots of new ideas. People like Galileo looking at our universe in different ways and, and sharing that information uh, with people and expanding our knowledge base about not only the world around us, um, but the universe around us. Um, so now, uh, real quickly, I'm going to try to get through as much of this as I can. I can't believe I'm, I'm whipping through like 10,000 years of human communication history in, in less than uh, two hours. But we're trying to get through as much of it as possible just to kind of give you some real benchmarks in terms of things that are kind of important, both in terms of world communication. And now I want to look at something that is important in terms of our, our own system of disseminating information in our country, which is the concept of the penny press, a concept that started uh, with this newspaper, the New York Sun, uh, 
in the uh, 1830s. Does anybody remember from the uh, reading of that article, why do we call it the penny press? How, do, how did that whole concept come to, come to pass? Yeah, it has to do with the with the the price a penny. Yeah, do you have any more? I was just saying it's a cheap newspaper that is affordable for most people. Yeah, and uh, basically, just to give you a little background on this, uh, the penny press was a paper that sold for a penny at a time when most newspapers sold for six cents a day. Now you know, you're probably thinking a penny six cents. You know what 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 the hell is the difference? Okay, who cares? But at a time, uh, it, it, and we're talking about the 1830s now, this was, this was a time when uh, people tended to make something, I think the average worker, maybe something to the tune of 75 cents a day was their salary, okay? Now six cents seems a little more significant, doesn't it? If 75 cents is all you make in one day. So um, the penny press was, was uh, a move that made, not only I think sparked more literacy among the general population, but also uh, changed the way we view news. And, and here's, here's what I mean by that. We talk a lot about, and I think we've even mentioned it in this class, about objectivity in journalism <laughs> and in, in the press. Um, was objectivity and, and fairness in, in the news, was that important to our founding fathers? Does anybody know the answer to that? Was that an important concept, that we have a, a, a press that was, that was objective and fair in, in disseminating information to us? Yeah. I'm sorry, speak up a little bit, because we've got a competition from a lawnmower now, yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah, the, and the press, by the way, is protected in the First Amendment, which also covers freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, pre freedom of religion. Uh, and it's no coincidence that all those things are in the First Amendment. They, they clearly felt that this was the most important place to start in, in drafting the amendments to the Constitution. Um, but what was their perception of what the press should be? Did they, they perceive it like we talk about it all the time uh, in terms of objectivity, in terms of fairness? Anybody know about that? I don't know if anybody's had a chance to study that. It's kind of an interesting question. And I bring it up because it comes up in other classes because people, and I would argue rightly so, sometimes get upset when they see so much bias in the news media. And it's important to point out that bias was all you had in the news media at the time of our founding fathers. There were only two kinds of newspapers when this country was founded. Commerce papers, they were basically business journals talking about you know, business trends, what was going on, trade publications, those kind of things. And papers that were basically arms of political parties. In other words, they were financed by political parties to espouse their political point of view. There was no such thing as objective journalism. In fact, there were no such thing as journalists. That was not a profession. It did not exist. These uh, papers, these political papers, were written by politicians and political operatives who were trying to promote their party's agenda. The First Amendment was important to the Founding Fathers because they wanted to ensure that they could express those opinions, which they had not been able to do under Great Britain rule, in a way that they were not persecuted for. They could freely argue their political points of view. So this, this is not a thing at all. And by the way, most people did not read newspapers because basically all it talked about was government issues and political points of view. And most people were not interested. So what happened with the New York Sun is the publisher, Benjamin Day, uh, decided he wanted to publish more news that was interesting to the common person. In other words, what's going on on the streets of New York? Uh, oh, was there a murder in this neighborhood today? Uh, oh, how about uh, the really bad weather we've been having this week? Uh, things that were affecting your day-to-day -day life. Um, his, his theory was that if he published those kind of things, 
people, more people would want to read the newspaper. Um, he was right. More people were interested. This led to another development of the penny press and of their ability to sell their papers so cheap. They became the first uh, newspapers to, to sell advertising. So this is the beginning of uh, uh, advertising in media, which is something that people still complain about to this day. Does it influence the kind of things that are being covered? Well, they, they started uh, allowing ads. This also supplemented the, the cost of the paper and made it very, not only easy for you to afford this paper, but it made it easy to literally explode the um, uh, circulation of any of these papers. Uh, for instance, um, within a few months after Benjamin Day started this whole concept of uh, the New York Sun and, and writing news that had affected the average person, uh, their circulation uh, went from, let's see, what was it, about 5,000 when he started this. Within two years, the number was up to 15,000. He tripled his circulation in two years with this new formula. Uh, very successful formula. He was making lots of money. So what happens when somebody comes up with a formula and makes lots of money off of it? People emulate it. So soon enough, all up and down the, the uh, eastern seaboard, you start seeing more so-called penny press newspapers uh, come out and uh, start, again, using this model of news, average things happening to average people, and actually not only writing less about politics, but actually, in some cases, uh, uh, shunning politics. Uh, there was a, a comment. I was going to see if I could find it because I thought it was a kind of a interesting. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, it, it was, this was a New York Sun article on congressional news. I'm going to read you the entire article. The proceedings of Congress thus far would not interest our readers. That's the article. They basically not only didn't do a lot of political coverage, they look at it and go, this is boring. We don't. Our readers don't care about this. So they kissed it off with one sentence and moved on and got back to what's going on in New York City and, and other things like that. So this is a model that was, was extremely successful. It, it starts uh, really uh, changing the look of papers. And, and this, this is, um, this is a something that's, I think, important to look at, too, in terms of how it affected not only the number of newspapers, but by increasing the number of newspapers, how it impacted uh, literacy. So I had some interesting numbers here. Uh, the, we talked about the pen press happening in the 1830s. Um, so let's, let's look what happened in a 10-year period from 1830 in America to 1840. Okay. And breaking it down into... Um, Weeklies and dailies. Weekly newspapers, daily newspapers. Okay, so in 1830, uh, you had um, 650 weeklies, and you had, uh, I need to hold things out, I need to start reading my, using my reading glasses for this. Um, <coughs> 65 dailies, okay, 65 dailies. So 1830, 650 weeklies in the US, 65 dailies. Within 10 years, that number had changed to almost double the number of weeklies, close to, not quite, but almost, almost doubling it, and uh, 138 dailies, so more than doubling the number of dailies. You know, think about these, these numbers and think about what newspapers, for instance, are going through right now where they're, they're, they're trying to stop the bleeding of losing circulation because nobody wants hard copies of papers anymore. So in a 10-year period in, in, a, in a society where things move very slowly, you had this massive explosion of newspapers and, and by extension, you started to see an explosion in literacy. People were interested in, in reading uh, the newspaper. Uh, what's also interesting is the next thing that comes along, just as the penny press is really starting to explode in this country, we have another huge development. 
Anybody know what that thing is? Telegraph. telegraph. Okay. Anybody know how a telegraph works? Yeah. You like to tap Morse code into those buttons, and it would like relay the message to another telegraph machine mm -hmm. far away. Yeah. And through wires, basically, yeah, you tap out a code that they, you would be translated in, into language, and it would travel through wires for forever far you had the wires going, and eventually they would be all over the country. So you could literally, by the time the this telegraph service was up and running, you could be able to send messages from New York to San Francisco instantly. Now, we talk about media changes disrupting uh, our society. Let's think about how this, this disrupted and dramatically changed things on a couple of levels. First of all, just the level of communication. I talked about this a little bit in my section on Tuesday. Um, what was the fastest way you could get information from point A to point B for the telegraph? Train would be one way, yeah, well, if you had a train, which a lot of places it, uh, in 1840, you know, and in 1840 still didn't have that, but yeah, absolutely, or horse, yeah, horse or train, that would be your two best bets. That could take days, weeks, and months, depending on where you were and what information you were trying to get through. Um, as an example of how this, why this is important, I use the example in my section of the War of 1812. All right, the most famous battle of the War of 1812 happened at the very end. It was the Battle of New Orleans. And uh, the US forces were led by General Andrew Jackson, the man on your $20 bills, and um, who later became President of the United States. He really became a national figure by winning this battle, uh, a decisive victory over the British in New Orleans. The interesting thing about it was the war was already over when he fought the battle. The British and the Americans had come to a, a truce in Washington previous to that battle. But he didn't know about it because that's how slow information travels. It had uh, come all the way from Washington, D.C., down the Mississippi to New Orleans before they got the word. Think if they had had a telegraph then. They were still about 30 years away, you know, 30 or 40 years away from having that. Think of what would have happened if they had had a telegraph. Would that battle have been fought? No, it would not have been fought. Uh, Jackson would have not had his big victory. You could argue he would never become the uh, president of the United States and never ended up on your $20 bills because of communication technology. So that just gives you an example of how technology can change the flow of history like we've talked about before. Now the other big impact here is what, how do you imagine when we, we're in an era now where we've changed the focus of, of newspapers and what they do and what information they provide, and it, a formula that is highly successful by the way, and right in the midst of this dramatic growth, here comes the telegraph. How do you imagine that played into the penny press explosion? What do you think? How was that important? How, how did that aid in what was already happening with newspapers? Yeah. Um, the stories could get to the publishers quicker. Absolutely, so that's one thing. In fact, is an example of that was during uh, the war with Mexico, uh, a decisive battle in that war. Uh, one of the major newspapers on the East Coast learned about the battle and the results of the battle before people in Washington learned about it. They actually were the ones who told them, oh, by the way, we won this battle. The people in Washington didn't know it because they didn't have the telegraph access that this newspaper had. So uh, it certainly allowed them to get information <coughs> first before anybody else. And what else did it do? Remember what the telegraph allows you to do instantaneously. How did that change the nature of, of papers and what they were able to do. Yeah, did you have your hand? I guess the um, average consumer of a paper could also put out information that they wanted others to hear instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Whereas before they, I guess they had that, but the telegraph, like you said, allowed them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's one thing. What else? What's, think about, Think about when you, you, turn, you watch news now or you look at news on the internet. 
what, what, where, where's the news from? I mean, where's it happening? What do you, is, it, is, it, is it just happening in Sonoma County or where? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking like in neighborhoods, like people would interview neighbors of where uh, an incident might have occurred. Yeah, but I'm talking about access though. If you have, a, what kind of access do you have? Yeah. Yeah, you can you know you can find out about anything happening anywhere in the world depending on what site you go to or where you go to get your information, right? So, think about this just in terms of first national and later it become international. But think about when as those telegraph lines go up. In terms of, as a communication tool, what a unifying <laughs> thing this is in terms of a, a national identity and what's going on. In other words, if you're in, in New York. You can know about something big going on in San Francisco, as they did, for instance, when you had the 1906 earthquake, right? Everybody in the country knew about that quake immediately because it went all over the telegraphs, all across uh, the country, okay? So, so there's this connection previously that was not in existence, so uh, uh, expand your knowledge base about not only what's happening around your country, but ultimately, what's happening around your world. Uh, it also leads to, uh, to a, a career that didn't exist before because the papers are becoming so popular, so widespread, and being able to cover so much information that at, after the penny press has started, somebody comes up with the idea of Gosh, we need to actually pay people to write stories. We're, 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 we're getting so much information. We're getting uh, so much circulation. Who's going to write this? A profession is born, the thing called journalists, which did not exist before. Not only do journalists now exist, but because of things like the Telegraph, it leads to uh, the associate. Have you heard of the Associated Press? Do anyone know what that is? What is the Associated Press? What, we hear that, we see that all the time in stories of the Associated Press is reporting. What is the Associated Press? The Associated Press, like, um, they're independent journalists who um, sell their stories to like, other news outlets. They, like they actually work for, you're close, they actually work for the Associated Press company, but what they do is they, um, they, you subscribe to the Associated Press. So let's say you have a newspaper in New York and you want coverage from things that are going on uh, in other parts of the country and parts of the world. Associated Press pays their reporters to write these stories from these different places in the world, and then you get the information from them. Basically, everybody, every subscriber is sharing that reporter. So if you pick up a bunch of papers, you know, if you go someplace like a newsstand where they have the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle, you can probably find articles, in the same article in both papers you know, that it has an AP byline, and um, they, will, they will have, you know, certainly they have their own reporters that cover specifically for them, but they also pay this pool of reporters to use their stories. And this was a huge development in terms of allowing a smaller paper, for instance, okay, I'm not the New York Times, I'm just a little paper in Wichita, Kansas, I can't afford a big a staff, but I can to pay the subscription fee for Associated Press, and now I can get reports from San Francisco, from New York. So again, the, this basically all leads to what we would call the first real push in the information age being created. You know, an age where you have more access to more information than ever before. And the two things that really allow this to happen is A, the printing press, and be the telegraph, which just expands your base of information. And then a formula, of course, on top of that, that formula being uh, the ability to uh, write news stories that people are interested in, other than what was the old model, okay? So as, as we wrap up today's discussion, uh, we, it's important to point out that what happened with the penny press and with the telegraphs and all the changes it, it brought about essentially created a template, a template for how journalism is still pursued to this day 
uh, certain 24-hour cable news uh, networks notwithstanding. It's the model for objective journalism, the model for the kind of stories they cover, and um, good and bad. And that's something I think it's important to point out, too. What, what's good about this model, this model of uh, ignoring things that uh, were previously covered all the politics and going for stuff happening in your community? What's good about it and what's potentially bad about it? Can you see any pluses or minuses on that model? Because the model we still use today, when you look at news today, what do you see as the pluses and minuses? Yeah. The plus is that you're aware of it. Um, a minus could be that that might uh, bring about a heightened sense of like, um, fear mm -hmm. if it's like a, a bad situation. Okay, uh, yeah, I think you're onto something there. He's talking about the fact that uh, you, you know more about your community but there's also a fear factor. Where's that fear factor coming from? Yeah. So like an example would be 9-11. Mm -hmm. You know, New York got attacked, uh, Washington got attacked, um, and everyone knew about it because they were able to communicate. Yeah. Um, and everyone, basically the entire day was on edge wondering if their city would be attacked next. Mm -hmm. So that's what the fear factor kind of. Yeah. And, it, and also, too, um, just even within the local communities, you could argue that this model created by the Penny Press says, we want things that interest the people. And we talked about this already in previous classes, right? Are the things that interest us, the people, necessarily the stories we should be paying attention to? Not always. Uh, we talked about that with celebrity news, right? We love our celebrity news, but is that what we should be uh, having our diet consist of in terms of consuming news and information? And you saw that happen as well in terms of not just celebrity news, but in terms of murders, in terms of scandals, political scandals. Suddenly these things started making their way into newspapers where they hadn't been prior uh, because people bought the paper when you put those things in. And this, so that was also the start of that. Uh, you saw it really kind of come to a really bad place, for instance, at the end of the 1800s when you had um, uh, the, the, what's called yellow journalism, William Randolph Hearst. Anybody familiar with William Randolph Hearst? Yeah, Hearst Castle, right? And uh, uh, he was a major newspaper publisher who specialized in yellow journalism and basically took... Um, information and juiced it up a little bit to make it uh, more sensational for the public. A great example of that was the fact that many people still argue to this day that uh, reports published in Hearst newspapers helped get public sentiment behind going to war with Spain. He wrote some very, his people wrote some very inflammatory reports which, which uh, increased public support for a war with Spain that happened. Uh, so clearly that's a huge ramification of, of yellow journalism. But there's a, the, the final point I want to make is that you, you, you have to be completely impressed with what happened in terms of the information age from just before the penny press started to the end of that century. So the explosion in the information age happened in the 1800s. And so my final point to kind of dramatize just how significant that was Okay, we're going to have um, newspapers in the year 1800, and then newspapers in 1899. So over the course of one century, how did things uh, change? Okay, um, there were in um, 1800, 235 newspapers in total in the United States, 235. Care to guess how many there were in 1899? 99 years later, how many newspapers were there in the US? Let's make it a game show. Who wants to guess how many you think there were? Yeah. 800, okay, that's pretty, that'd be a pretty big jump, 235 to 800. Anybody else want to take a stab at this? Yeah. 10,000, okay, that's a really big jump, okay. Anybody else? 1,000. 1,000, okay. 
1,500. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of guesses kind of in the 1,000 area, either the high hundreds uh, to uh, you know, 1,500. There's a lot of guesses in that range. Actually, the guess in the, what would you say? 10,000. You were the closest, but you were still a little off. There were more than 17,000 by the end of that century. Okay. Oh, actually, accuracy is important. 16,000, sorry. All right. 16,000 by the end of that century. Think about that for a second. Is that an explosion of information or what? And, um, and it shows you that it, it really sets the stage for the century we were about to enter, uh, the 20th century, which will now see the uh, electronic media come into play. And, and, and as somebody was mentioning at the beginning of this period, ways that could not be imagined uh, in the 1800s. The so 20th century was going to bring all kinds of changes no one saw coming. And so what we're going to talk about next week is we're going to talk about those 20th century uh, changes as we wrap up our stroll through communication history. Um, and we're also going to talk about entertainment because we tend to think about entertainment in media as a more modern phenomenon, but it actually goes back uh, quite a bit further as well. So those are going to be the two topics uh, for next week. So um, did I write on the board or did that? Oh, oh I, did, I, did, you, did I erase it? Okay, sorry about that. I erased my own assignment. Um, so the, of the five articles, the last two that we're, we haven't read yet, which is the article on entertainment and mass media and the article called The Image Dissectors. Those are the two to read uh, for next week. So see you then.